of our financial secretary. You know his academic record. I think everybody in this city knows about his many exciting pursuits. They know he's a fighting financial secretary, whether it's with a rapier or whether it's in the dojo. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that he has done a tremendous job for Lion Rock. We always say that Sir John Copperthwaite is one of our great heroes. Um, but of course, he had very different pressures on him uh, compared to our current financial secretary. And we think he's done a marvelous job with the pressures he has on him, and we'd like to hear him come up and tell us a little bit about what's coming. One thing I will note today, the uh, government announced they were launching the consultations for the policy address and the budget, and I guess that means that you're open for business. If anybody's got an opinion, they can come and talk to you tonight. All right, very good. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it from our financial secretary, the Honorable John Tom. Please help me welcome him. But you know, but of course, you know, everybody wants to hear from Andrew Shun, Pac-Man Shun as well. And I know that he's ready because he told me he's got a little something he wants to say before he gets up. And of course I forgot. So Andrew? Uh, I was supposed to do the introduction to, uh, to the next speaker, Andrew Mark. <laughs> I guess it's, 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 a, it's a classical liberal uh, organization, so we do things classical liberally. <laughs> uh, I prepared a long speech to uh, introduce um, the next speaker, and uh, I ripped it up. And I thought that I wanted to share something that was deep in my heart. Um, it is indeed true that we first met uh, the next speaker uh, at the WTO conference in uh, 2005. In fact, in that particular round of meetings, uh, the first marketplace that that meeting was supposed to tackle was legal services. And in Hong Kong, if you were to go from middle class to being destitute, all it takes is one case that requires a barrister. So that is why the Lion Rock Institute was fully behind that particular round of negotiations. Um, personally, I first met the next speaker um, because every year the government would host two rounds of consultations. One for the Hong Kong budget, the other for the policy address. And uh, we call it in Cantonese, Chun Chao Yi Zai, because one of them happens in spring and the other one happens in autumn. And uh, after going for perhaps six or seven of these meetings, uh, we discovered something. And we told the uh, next speaker and everyone on that side of the table in the then central government offices. We said that. We've been here, the Lion Rock Institute has been to these consultations for six or seven times, and we have realized that none of our recommendations has been picked up by the government. <laughs> to which, of course, I added that only means the Lion Rock Institute has to try harder. So, uh, in fact, what, the reason why I would stand up here is to say that uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, that district council, I would understand, there was a particular plan in which we pushed for, uh, which is the Hong Kong government subsidizes to the tune of a quarter million Hong Kong dollars per every degree student in Hong Kong. And we said that in view that there is a lack of spaces in universities, why don't the Hong Kong government try to fund Hong Kong students to study abroad? And in the, late, in the last latest budget, uh, the next speaker announced that uh, he would in fact do that, and he has set up a fund were 400 million that would perpetually, in theory, send 20 students abroad from Hong Kong to study abroad. And of course, the Lion Rock Institute hopes that that is the first step. But of course, that is not also the reason why I'm standing here today. Uh, from deepest from my heart, something touched me when the next speaker announced his budget in March. And it wasn't just the plan that he announced, and I want to quote now. It was in his concluding remarks that sent everyone who was listening to the speech in the Lion Rock Institute budget clapping and cheering. And what did the next speaker say? And I hear my quote. Sorry, I have an old phone, very slow. The next speaker said in his concluding remarks, wealth redistribution seems to be a quick fix to improve the livelihood of the grassroots. But the lesson in Europe in recent years tell us that welfareism is not sustainable. To put that in his concluding remarks, <laughs> perhaps with the intention to cheer us up, it would surely make angry those who demand more welfare. But it's the next, next line that really captured us. It has long been my steadfast belief that we can provide everyone opportunities to change his life through developing the economy, creating quality employment opportunities, investing vigorously in education and training to increase social mobility. 
I trust that this is also a common value for all of us. In the Lion Rock Institute, we call that the Lion Rock Spirit. And with that particular line, I think the next speaker has proven to be a friend of the Lion Rock Institute. So may I officially <laughs> welcome the next speaker, the Financial Secretary of Hong Kong, Mr. John Kai. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm indeed pleased to join you all this evening at the Lion Rock Institute Economic Freedom of the World Annual Dinner. This is also an honor for me to welcome Fred McMahon from the Fresh Institute back to Hong Kong. The release of the Annual Economic Freedom of the World Report is keenly anticipated by our government, by our business sector, and by observers around the world. It was in 1990 that Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman wrote that Hong Kong was perhaps the best example of a free market economy. And almost a quarter of a century later, Hong Kong is still the best place to witness the power of the free market at work and free market principles continue to be the centerpiece of Hong Kong's remarkable development. As Hong Kong and the world around us evolve, we are continuing to refine our own brand of economic model. The trend of globalization and the recent global financial crisis have, been a, have had a profound impact on the way the economic world now operates. Despite all these trends and unprecedented circumstances, remaining true to our economic principles has not only helped us overcome the many challenges that have arisen, but also enabled us to grasp the opportunities that come our way. Economic freedom has long been the cornerstone of Hong Kong's stability, our growth, as well as our prosperity. Market-led reforms have steered the city's transformation from a sleepy fishing village into a manufacturing center, and in recent years, into an international financial center as well as service hub. The same forces of supply and demand are now driving Hong Kong towards a knowledge-based economy that focuses on creativity, innovation, and technology, while making sure that the quality of our labor force keeps up with our pace of development. For free markets to operate efficiently, it is important to staunchly uphold the rule of law, maintain a low and simple tax system, and encourage fair competition. These three elements are crucial for the effective functioning of our market economy. So let me take a few minutes to explain how these three elements contribute to the efficient operation of the market of Hong Kong. First, the rule of law. We have a long and proud tradition of the rule of law in Hong Kong, and we are continuing to uphold the rule of law based on tried and trusted common law principles. Our community is law-abiding, our business community respects contracts, and they honor promises. And since reunification in 1997, we have added a constitutional layer to our legal framework. Today, our economic freedom is not just an unwritten tradition. Instead, our rights and freedoms are explicitly protected and guaranteed in our constitutional document, the basic law. Well-protected private property rights, together with an independent judiciary, encourage enterprise, provide predictability, as well as facilitate long-term planning. The unrestricted flow of capital allows funds to be channeled for maximum return and fosters greater efficiency in allocation of resources. Free flows of information, of ideas, and talent provide an environment that nurture innovation. Second, the Hong Kong model of low and simple taxes has produced a business environment that promotes commerce, innovation, growth, and development. Individuals and companies can focus on enhancing productivity, 
secure in the knowledge that they will be able to enjoy the maximum fruits of their own labor. A successful low-tax model is only possible with prudent fiscal management. Over the years, we have kept public spending at a historical average of around one-fifth of our GDP. This means that 80% of our community's wealth is in the hands of individuals and companies, and they are often more efficient and more capable of creating more values. This 4 to 1 private to public allocation ratio has enabled Hong Kong to make the best use of our limited resources. And in so doing, we maximize productivity and maintain a functional and responsive public administration. Third, competition is indeed the fundamental basis of a market economy, without which supply and demand curves would not even cross. Competition is also a crucial element of Hong Kong's DNA. In Cantonese, we have a saying, no competition, no improvement. To Hong Kong people, competition is the driving force to excel. It also supports a process of natural selection that makes us stronger and more adaptive to the changing external environment. We compete not only through our own companies, but also by providing a level playing field for all businesses. Local and overseas companies compete side by side in Hong Kong. For example, foreign companies incorporated in Hong Kong and their local counterparts are treated equally under our cross-boundary free trade agreement, SIPA. They have equal opportunities under SIPA to access markets in the world's fastest growing large economy. Also, banks registered in Hong Kong, regardless of nationality, have equal access to our real efficient real-time growth settlement system, which allows them to compete for offshore renminbi business on a level footing. Hong Kong's rule of law, our simple and low tax regime and fair competition environment have made Hong Kong a preferred destination for foreign investment. In 2012, Hong Kong was the third largest recipient of foreign direct investment in the world after only the United States and mainland China. As an international financial center, we are also ranked third behind London and New York in the Global Financial Centers Index. The World Bank ranks Hong Kong as the world's second easiest place to do business. Our merchandise trade in 2012 was more than four times our GDP. Our per capita GDP has reached 37,000 US dollars per annum, ranking seventh in the world according to IMF measure based on purchasing power parity. All this reflects the power of the free market in a small city with few natural resources. Free market principles have served Hong Kong well in the past, and I believe that it will continue to do so in the future. We are keenly aware of concerns, even criticisms, that some decisions made by the Hong Kong government in recent years appear to deviate from our much cherished free market principles. So allow me to give you an account of some of these decisions. And let's all be clear up front that Hong Kong is a pragmatic practitioner of free market economics. We are not a purist of the orthodox school which believes in the absolute omnipotence of the market. Markets do fail from time to time, and when they do, it is the government's responsibility to step in. Some people believe that simply by having a government, there is already too much intervention in the market. I don't believe there is a functioning economy anywhere that can operate without some degree of government involvement. Market forces alone often don't channel investments in the public goods and services that do not maximize returns. Market forces alone will not favor investments, such as physical infrastructure projects, which require huge upfront capital with uncertain payback. Yet, these are often essential investments that require government to step in. After years of active fiscal intervention to improve the capacity of Hong Kong and to enhance the livelihood of our people, 
total government expenditure in 2013-14 is some 80% higher than the actual expenditure in 2007-2008 when I first became financial secretary. That is equivalent to an average increment of about 11% or nearly $35 billion per year. There are criticisms from pro-market commentators, some of whom are present here today, that we have departed from fiscal prudence, that we are overexpanding the market, the government's footprint in economic activities. This is not really the case. We have not been overspending. We have been fortunate enough to generate adequate additional revenue in recent years to meet the increasing needs of the community while maintaining expenditure at around 20% of GDP. We have been living well within our means, allocating resources to where they are needed most and in the most effective manner. For example, we are helping businesses to help themselves through difficult times. SMEs are the backbone of Hong Kong's economy. They have been especially hot hit by the recent global recession. In May last year, we introduced the SME Financing Guarantee Scheme. So far, 7,600 applications have been approved, with total amount of loans over $32 billion. In my budget in February, I extended application period for the scheme for another year. This measure was among a basket of budget initiatives that carry a stimulus effect of about 1.3 percentage points. This stimulus has helped us maintain a low unemployment rate, currently at 3.3 percent amid the gloomy external environment. We have redoubled our commitment in the last few years to investing in infrastructural development to facilitate our city's future growth and future prosperity. The estimated expenditure on capital works will exceed $70 billion during the current fiscal year, which is more than triple the amount in 2007-2008. Major projects include the 29-kilometer bridge, the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, the expansion of railway networks, as well as the Kaitech Development Project. Each one of these infrastructure projects brings multiplying effects in creating jobs, in promoting efficiency, and in strengthening connectivity with key markets. We are also spending $10 billion to help phase out high polluting pre-Euro 4 commercial diesel vehicles. This initiative, together with other clean air measures, will substantially help reduce roadside pollution in our central business district, and in turn, help us attract and retain, hopefully, high-quality talent from Hong Kong and overseas. With lessons reinforced by the recent debt crisis in advanced economies and in light of a shrinking workforce due to an aging population, maintaining fiscal prudence is more important today than ever. As a caring society, while we see the need to provide the necessary assistance to the less fortunate members of our community, Maintaining economic efficiency and ensuring fiscal sustainability will continue to be the overriding guiding principle of our economic strategy. There are also occasions when market forces alone are inadequate to maintain market equilibrium and government intervention is appropriate. Our property market has been at the eye of a perfect economic storm in recent years. Ultra-low interest rates and plentiful liquidity, coupled with tight supply and strong demand, have combined to send local property prices on an almost uninterrupted uptrend in the past few years. Market forces alone had not been effective in increasing supply and curtailing demand because of the lack in supply of new flats and the general demand side expectation that prices will continue to rise. Overall, flat prices in August this year were 135% above the trough in late 2008. That was not that long ago. And have exceeded the 1997 peak by 42%. The home purchase affordability mortgage to income ratio was into 
in the second quarter of 2013. That far exceeds the long-term average of 48% over the past two decades. If interest rates were to rise by three percentage points to a more normal level, the ratio would soar to 72%. Past experience has highlighted how wild fluctuations in property prices could have significant ramifications for our city's macroeconomic and financial stability. While the government is releasing more land for homes, it will take some time to have a substantive impact on the market. And to cope with the immediate market distortions and avoid the formation of a property bubble, the government has taken steps to manage demand and reduce the possible risk of financial stability arising from an over-exuberant property market. After three rounds of demand side management measures since 2010, and six rounds of macroprudential measures since 2009, the property market is finally showing signs of stabilizing since early this year. Transactions have cooled, market sentiments has begun to reverse, and there is now a greater expectation for a general price correction in the market. Unfortunately, uncertainties remain, including the US Federal Reserve's pace of tapering its bond buying program and the movement of hard money. This could have a significant impact on global asset prices, including flat prices here in Hong Kong. So we must remain alert. I want to emphasize that these multiple rounds of counter-cyclical initiatives are extraordinary measures during extraordinary times. They have been imposed to cope with market failures and by no means represent a departure from our firm commitment to free market principles. They are not permanent features. They will be withdrawn once the property market becomes stable and healthy again. But they must become law first. I would urge our legislators to facilitate early passage of these bills. And my final topic today is the statutory minimum wage introduced in May 2011. Legislating for a minimum wage is an important policy initiative of the previous government to protect low-income workers in vulnerable sectors. In introducing the SMW, we took into account the need to maintain flexibility in adjusting wages and prices in response to adverse economic shocks. Our SMW regime provides a wage floor to forestall excessively low wages while not unduly affecting Hong Kong's labor market flexibility and economic competitiveness. The results so far have been encouraging. Low-income families have seen a significant increase in their wages. Business continues to do well, and our job market continues to operate at full employment. We are mindful that the long-term effect has yet to be observed, and the performance in periods of economic contraction remains un untested. The implementation of SMW does not represent a shift in policy direction at all. Economic freedom is the cornerstone of Hong Kong's competitiveness, and we continue to cherish the attributes of a market economy. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for this opportunity for me to talk about some of the challenges that our city is facing, and how our commitment to maintaining a free and open market has helped to keep Hong Kong on its toes on top of the game. We are committed to embracing fair competition. We are committed to strengthening our business-friendly market mechanism and upholding the rule of law and sharpening our competitiveness. Hong Kong's number one ranking by the Fraser Institute in its Economic Freedom of the World Report is a strong motivation for us to further open up our markets and demonstrate to our trading partners and to the rest of the world that a free economy is the way of the future. Thank you very much. Um, if I could ask the Financial Secretary to stand on stage, if we could ask our Chairman, uh, Mr. Stacy, to come up, uh, as well, uh, Fred McMahon, and I'd like to invite, um, you know, we were originally thinking of doing a toast, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Wong, uh, we, we put him in charge of the shops, and uh, he tells me what to do. Um, and so he said he'd like to have the head table come up for photos. 
uh, with, with the financial secretary. So if I could please invite the managing director for CLP, Mr. Paul Poon, to join us on stage. Mr. Albert Chan, the executive manager from the Hong Kong Jockey Club. Ms. Florence Hui, the undersecretary for home affairs, if you could please join us. Mr. S.S. S. Yun, sitting next to me, the COO of Power Assets. Uh, George Yun, representing the Hong Kong Institute of Directors. Monsieur Jean-Christian Briand, the Vice Consul of the Canadian Consulate General, here to uh, come and see his countrymen from the Fraser Institute. Thank you very much. Yao Xing Mu, the Under Secretary for Transport and Housing, if you could please join us. As I said, uh, Mr. Peter Wong tells me what to do, the Executive Director of the Lion Rock Institute. And uh, certainly, last but certainly not least, Dr. Tong Men Long, the CEO of Galo, if you could please join us on stage to get your picture taken and have a toast with the Financial Secretary. Um, if I could please ask two more people, Andrew Shun Pak Man and Simon Li Chao Fu, perhaps they could come and join us as well, especially after I almost railroaded Andrew Shun off stage uh, with his, his magnificent introduction that he had ready at the go. So ladies and gentlemen, please raise your glasses. We're here tonight to celebrate Hong Kong and freedom. Thank you very much for coming this evening.